What's up guys? Welcome to this hard mode Nakatra the Devourer talk through guide. In some of the past guides, I've had the feedback from you guys that's really, really valid that I use the same necromancy setup every time, and sometimes the methods I use don't perfectly apply if I'm using one of the other styles, because the focus is on the setup more than on the mechanics themselves. And in this one, I want to change that and try something just a little bit different. So for this video, instead of me giving you kind of the same setup I always give you, or kind of a preset setup and a preset rebo bar, for this one, what I want to do is we're actually going to be doing hard mode Nakatra in a solo, but this time around, I'm going to be using no food, I'm going to be using no armor, at all. And then for my weapons, I'm actually using tier 50s. So basically, I'm going to have worse damage mitigation than any regular gear. I'm going to have worse damage dealing ability than any other gear as well. Uh, so really, this is going to be a deep dive into the mechanics and all of the best ways to deal with them. No matter what gear you have, if you can master the mechanics of this boss fight, you will be able to complete this boss fight no matter what. So with that said, why don't we jump right into it? Of course, I happen to be using Necromancy here, so let's get the Conjures going. And then we are going to jump directly in to the Nakatra fight. You're also gonna notice that on the bottom left-hand side of the screen, there's a pop-up that is showcasing uh, all of my kind of Necromancy Conjures and keeping track of them. I've also linked it in the description down below. It is an Alt-1 plugin. In addition to that, I've also got an ability tracker active that is just copying and taking a screenshot of every manual input that I make so that hopefully if you want to slow things down or kind of want a deeper dive into what buttons I'm pressing, uh, that should allow you to do that. Uh, so. The very first mechanic of Nakatra, uh, what I want to do is I want to highlight four areas on the ground that are really, really good to stand in general. These areas are important to stand in because for a lot of the area mechanics throughout the fight, uh, you're going to end up directly on the tile next to the safe zone. And what this allows you to do is whenever you get area mechanics on the ground, you should have less overall moving required to get out of the way. Very good example here is the very first mechanic of the boss fight, where Nakatra is going to show some telegraphing over certain areas of the screen that I don't even need to highlight necessarily because they are so abundantly clear. Whenever you see that wave rippling down the screen, that means in just a couple seconds, you're also going to have an attack that will deal damage down that same area. So for this one, I'm going to quite simply take one singular step north, and then a couple seconds later, once it's passed, I'm then going to take one singular step south. And that's the real benefit of the area that I'm standing in that I'm going to highlight again. In general throughout the fight, if you're running around the room and you're kind of interacting with the mechanics, uh, and then you find yourself standing anywhere that isn't one of these areas marked in screen, uh, that is a good sign that you may want to move to one of those areas as it might make one of the next mechanics coming up easier. Something else I'm going to mention here is that Nakatra has an adrenaline bar underneath her HP bar, and that is absolutely awesome because if you want to know when the next special attack is, it's going to be whenever that adrenaline bar is full and it fills up very simply every single time she attacks. So it's just going to slowly charge up in chunks of one third, and then whenever it's full, you're going to get your next mechanic. So there we go, we're full again, and now Nakatra is going to say, prepare for death. For this mechanic, there are a couple options. The easiest option by far is to pray, deflect magic, and then use the devotion ability. And in doing this, you're gonna block all three magic hits that in base damage all deal about 12,000 damage. But in the setup I'm currently using, I'm struggling for damage. So instead of that, we're gonna do something just a little bit different. And instead of doing that, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be doing a combination of reprisal, reflect, and resonance. Here's how that's gonna work. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use reflect. The second thing I'm going to do after that is I'm going to activate Reprisal. It's an ability that when active will store the damage I take and then unleash it back on my attacker. And then the one last thing I'm going to do after I use Reprisal is I'm also going to use a Power Burst of Vitality. What this is going to do is it's going to double my life points for 6 seconds. So for this mechanic, each of the hit splats is going to deal about 12,000 damage to me, so being able to Power Burst up and have 23,794 total life points is extremely helpful. And what that's going to do is that's going to allow me to actually be using Soul Split so that my Reprisal stores even more damage, and my Reflect also does even more damage. So here, let's take a look at what happens here. So that very first hit that's going to go through there is actually going to reflect 14,700 damage. But then after that first hit, what I need to do to make sure I don't die is then use Resonance. And then after that second hit that I'm actually going to use Resonance on and heal up on, I'm then going to put my Deflect Magic Prayer back on just to make the timing a little bit easier and so that I don't come out of this mechanic with no life points left. And coming out of that special attack, because we chose to do a Vitpot Reflect Reprisal Resonance strategy, what ended up happening is instead of just dealing with this mechanic, we've actually kind of pulled an Uno Reverse card on Nakatra and we've actually managed to deal 50,000 damage back to her just by dealing with that mechanic. So once again, Devotion is super safe, but this is a really, really cool method, especially if you're struggling with damage. It might take a bit of time to master and get the timing down, but as soon as we got the timing down, you're in a great spot. 
After that mechanic, Nakatra is actually going to go back to the very first mechanic, and we're already standing in the right spot to dodge it, so dodge it as expected. And then we've got our first brand new mechanic, where this time around, we're going to get the same area mechanics as before, but this time we're also going to get two scarabs that are going to spawn. There's a corrupted scarab healer, and there's also a volatile scarab. The trick to these scarabs is that they need to be stunned before they take any actual damage. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to click on the first scarab, and I'm going to use Soul Strike. And then I'm going to click on the second scarab, and a Soul Strike that one as well. It's worth noting that if you're using a combat style like Necromancy, there are some disadvantages that come with it, which is kind of weird to say because it is Necromancy, but one of them is the attack range, and it is possible that you could actually get run out into the Soul Fire, in which case you are going to take a chunk of damage. But because I flicked my Deflect Magic Prayer, it's not going to kill me. Without the Mage Prey, that hit is at least six or 7,000 damage, which puts you in a pretty bad spot. But with that out of the way, as soon as you stun both the Scarabs, you can kill them however you would like. I also want to mention that if you ignore the healing Scarab, Nakatra is going to heal for 30,000 life points, and if you ignore the exploding Scarab, you're going to get hit for about 8,000 damage once the bar above its head runs out. So if you wanted to, you could optionally ignore them, but I think it's pretty worthwhile to take the time and get them down. And now we're in to another Prepare for Death, but this one's a little bit different than the last one, because first off, my Power Burst of Vitality is still on cooldown, so I can't use it to double my life points. But I also don't have very many life points at all, so because of that, if I were to do a Reflect strategy, I would die through my Reflect. This time around, I've activated Devotion, I've activated Deflect Magic, and then the one other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the Resonance ability, and then I'm going to very quickly flick off of my Deflect Magic Prayer for one of the three attacks. What that's going to do is that's going to get me a free heal all the way to full HP, and we are going to continue the fight. We've got more ground mechanics, and the Catra is just about to phase at 960,000 life points. So now, we're going to have a very similar set of mechanics as previous, but there is one new mechanic that is added, and it's going to come out right now. For this mechanic, Nakatra is going to spawn at some areas in blue on the floor. It's also worth noting that if you wanted to zoom out and point your camera toward the walls, the walls actually glow in the pattern that is going to be safe beforehand. But in my opinion, this is not worth doing at all because it takes you away from the fight and you want to be focused on the attacks and the mechanics and Nakatra instead of spending the entire fight staring at the walls. So for this one, it's pretty simple. If you're standing in one of the areas that we outlined earlier in the fight, you may not have to move at all. But you'll notice here that even if I did have to move, it is unlikely likely that it's going to have to be anywhere far. That being said, if you do get hit by any of these ground mechanics that spawn and then explode, what will happen is you're going to take about 8,000 damage. In this instance, the second ground mechanic is on a tile I'm standing on, so I'm just going to very simply dive to the next tile. Something I do here that is a really, really good tip that I haven't seen too many people talking about is the dive ability gets reset every single time you dodge the ground mechanic. So what that means is if you successfully dodge it with dive, you can then just dive again and again and again every single time you get this mechanic, which makes it a lot easier. But with that said, we were able to successfully dodge this one, so let's keep it going. After that first ground mechanic on phase two, we're then going to get another prepare for death, and this time around, I'm going to use reflect because I've got a couple life points to give. But I am going to elect to also resonance that final hit so that I'm coming out of it on max HP. And after that, we're just going to continue focusing on dodging the ground mechanics, and even though a lot of these ground mechanics look terribly intimidating where half of the arena looks like it's about to blow up, the reality is if you're standing in this area, very likely you're going to have a situation like me here where I just need to walk or dive one singular tile and that's it. Then once once again, I can move one tile and we're good to go. One other thing that I want to mention here is that between every single special attack Nakatra does, Nakatra is going to alternate between using magic attacks, as you just saw there, to as soon as you see the special attack, and uh, Nakatra is then going to switch to range attacks. So you don't have to count the auto attacks like a lot of other bosses where you have to like constantly pay attention. Just anytime you get a special attack, you can assume that if you were being attacked with ranged, you're then going to be attacked by magic, and so on and so forth throughout the entire fight. So it's really important to note. The other thing to look at is if you keep your light points high enough, you can just wait, and if you get hit by something that is not what you're currently praying, swap your prayers and do that as quickly as you can. This next mechanic here is the exact same as the one on phase one, where we got ourselves a set of scarabs, but the one difference is coming out of that set of scarabs, and before you may have had a chance to deal with all of them, what's going to happen is you're going to get more ground mechanics, which can also pull you away from the scarabs. For that reason, it's really important to get rid of the scarabs early if you want to go that route, and make sure you're stunning them as soon as they spawn. But once you've got these ground mechanics, your focus needs to shift to staying in the safe areas and getting out of the way. So in this instance, even though I've got that healing scarab alive, well, what's the condition if that healing scarab reaches Nakatra. Well, Nakatra is going to heal a little bit. 
but if I don't move, I'm going to die. So let's get out of the way as soon as we possibly can by using dive. So that's one dive to get out of the way. And then just like that, that is a second dive to get myself out of the way. At this point, I'm then gonna finish off my healer and we are gonna continue whittling away at Nakatra's life points. We've got another prepare for death. And this time around, I'm gonna use a reflect and a resonance to give me some life points back because we very clearly need them. And then we've got even more ground mechanics on the floor, especially after the mechanics that make you move around the room a lot. It's really important to recalibrate yourself and reposition yourself in one of the preferred areas. It's very easy to get focused on the running around and the dodging, and then you can end up somewhere unpleasant. And if you don't move back in time, you can end up getting caught out. So you're gonna notice that I'm always remaining in the same location. And that's basically my home base for this boss fight. I've got more ground mechanics. I'm gonna dive the first one, I'm gonna dive the second one, and we're just gonna keep very, very slowly and inefficiently chipping away at Nakatra's life points. Something you're gonna notice here too is even though I've got no armor and I've got no food, I'm actually doing okay on life points here. And the vast majority of that is just because I'm using resonance. It is such a strong ability and I really love mechanics where you get to take an enemy mechanic that would otherwise be very, very punishing and effectively turn it against your enemy that you're attacking. Because right now, Nakatra's prepare for death mechanic is actually giving me more life Life points than it is hindering Nakatra's, which I think is absolutely awesome. This time around, because two minutes have passed since the last time I used my Power Burst of Vitality, I was able to use it again here, so we did the exact same thing as the very, very first Prepare for Death, where we used our Vip Pot, we used Reflect, we used Reprisal, and we're gonna get even more damage. But outside of that, the main focus on this boss fight really needs to be the mechanics themselves and dodging them as effectively as possible. As you can tell, even though I'm doing almost no damage, I'm actually doing completely fine in this boss fight. Unlike a boss like Vorkath where there's a lot of random damage coming where you kind of need a decent baseline of damage output to be able to get through the boss fight. And Nakatra, it's not like that at all. This is all mechanics. So as long as you can learn the mechanics and focus on them, you'll be clearing out this boss in no time. And just like that, we've got another set of scarabs. So once again, I'm gonna dodge the area mechanics and then I'm gonna prioritize clearing out these scarabs and stunning each of them once before we get those ground mechanics. I've got more ground mechanics, so we're gonna continue to move along and make sure that I'm standing in the safe areas. One other thing I wanna mention about the ground mechanics that light up the entire area in the quadrant is that they do also disable all of your defensive abilities. So just as a very quick important note, uh, you can't just like use barricade or use reflect or anything to mitigate them. You have to dodge them by using movement abilities or by standing in a good place. Alternatively, if you do get hit by them, you're going to take about 8,000 damage, but this can be reduced with a setup. So as an example, if you were using Hellhound and the Aegis Aura along with your setup, instead of taking 8,000 damage, you would take about 5,750, which is a lot more manageable. Still, we've got one final prepare for death, and then we are going to be heading in to the next phase of hard mode. At 480,000 life points, Nakatra is going to say Nephthys and then spawn two dogs. And these dogs have a couple interesting mechanics. The first mechanic that's really important to know with the Nephthys this, is that they take reduced damage the further you are standing away from them. So you actually want to be in melee distance and you want the Nephthys to be attacking you. That's why we don't just kind of stand out in a safe area and we want to be as close to them as humanly possible. So you'll see for this ground mechanic that I'm going to step backwards, get out of the way, and then I'm going to move right back into melee distance so that I'm dealing as much damage as I possibly can. One other important mechanic on the Nephthys is that Nakatra is actually going to heal them every 25 seconds or so. And because of this, this heal is actually going to bring them up by 50,000 HP. So if you're dealing almost no damage, what's going to happen is you may have to repeat this phase or this section a couple times as you fight the same dog over and over and over again. But if I was able to get this done with no armor and tier 50 weapons, it should be very manageable regardless of what your setup is. Just remember that there are things that you can do to increase your damage output. Things like vulnerability bombs that give you 10%, or even using some Ripper Demon Scrolls, which is what I'm doing right here, to get that tiny bit of extra damage could be the difference between getting it done and having an infinite Nephthys phase. So as you can see here, I'm just prioritizing focusing on the mechanics. I'm focusing on dodging all the areas on the ground, and we're just gonna try to deal as much damage as we possibly can to the Snephthys. Obviously with this gear setup, it is an extreme hindrance, and if you had better gear, you'd already be out of the Nephthys phase, but even with this tier 50 setup, I'm able to get through the phase. And that is something that I wanted to kind of showcase in this video as something that is possible even without the best gear. And just like that, I've taken out both Nephthys. And one thing I want to mention is before we enter the Devourer plane, 
uh, for the start of the final phase of the boss fight, there's actually a very brief period where Nakatra is able to be damaged. So if you want to, you can use a powerful ability on Nakatra right about here, and it will actually deal full damage. So right there, if I'd wanted to use something like a Volley of Souls or a Death Guard special, say I'm using range, I could chuck a Dark Bow special attack. If I'm using magic, I could use Omni Power. And if I was using melee, I could use a Dragon Claw special or a Hurricane or maybe an Overpower, and it would deal full damage. This is considered a pre-phase, and it can be nice, especially when you're working on your kill times. But for what I'm doing right now, our kill times don't terribly matter. We are just trying to get through this thing. So with that said, Nakatra is going to say the Devourer will consume you, and then I have now been sent into the Devourer's Plane. As soon as you get sent into the plane, you want to pray deflect melee, and you can also optionally use Devotion if you would like, because those gorillas are going to start meleeing you. And at that point, you're going to see a pink cloud that you need to click on, and that will spawn two soul devourers that you need to kill before your soul is completely devoured, which can be monitored in a very stressful way by looking at the timer right under Nakatra's HP bar. If this reaches zero, this is an insta-kill mechanic, so we've got 27 seconds right now to clear out both of these dogs and then deal with the souls that they drop. The rotation you want to do on these Soul Devourers is going to really depend on the combat style you're using, but it should be extremely manageable with practice. The one thing you may want to do is just spend a little bit of time thinking about which area of effect attacks a certain combat style might be able to benefit from. If you're ranging, something like Bombardment could be a really good move, and beyond that, even something like Corruption Shot or Corruption Blast could be really, really nice for getting some good damage on both. If you're meleeing, you've got things like Cleave, Quake, Meteor Strike, and Hurricane that all hit multiple enemies, so it's a really good way to clear out both of them at the same time time. And with Necromancy, of course, we've got Threads of Fate, which we can use to very effectively take any of our abilities and chain them onto multiple targets, which is what I did there. But now, as soon as we kill the two Soul Devourers, what's going to happen is three Soul Fragments are going to spawn on the ground, and you need to click on them before the timer runs out. But before you click on the third and final Soul Fragment, you need to take note of the two icons that are on screen. I'm going to call the one on the left the sun, and I'm going to call the one on the right the crocodile. You need to remember which icons are being shown. This is absolutely essential for the next part of the boss fight. So what I like to do is I actually like to say it out loud. So in this instance, I would say sun, crocodile, and then you can release that final soul fragment. At this point, I'm still repeating to myself, sun, crocodile, sun, crocodile, sun, crocodile. And then as soon as you get back into the fight, what's going to happen is Nakatra is actually going to spawn three separate icons on the floor while charging up a one-shot attack. You're going to notice that both of the icons that were present in the Devourer's Realm are also present back in Nakatra's arena. And what you want to do is you want to stand on the one that wasn't present. So in this instance, I've got a sun, I've got a crocodile, and I've got a monkey. There was no monkey in the Devourer's Plane, so I'm going to stand on top of the monkey icon, and that is what's going to keep me safe from Nakatra's fatal attack. This is also a good opportunity to deal some damage to the boss, as Nakatra has a brief immunity, but after that, she's taking full damage. Okay, we're jumping to a different kill here because there was actually a visual change made to this mechanic uh, at the time of recording for my previous clip. So this is just a regular normal kill and then we'll jump back to the previous kill uh, as soon as we get through this one mechanic. And this mechanic is called the Shockwave and it's the mechanic that I think the most people struggle with because it looks extremely intimidating, but if you do it right, it's actually quite easy and I'm going to show you three separate ways of dealing with it. The first method is the most complicated one, and it quite simply involves stepping one tile forward at the exact right moment to avoid all damage. But with this method, although it looks extremely cool and it's really, really effective, you only have one single game tick or 0.6 seconds of a window to make this move. If you move too early or too late, you're going to get hit for about 7 to 8,000 damage. Before we get into it, one thing I'm going to mention as well is the Power Burst of Vitality is really clutch here, especially when you're practicing. If you use a Power Burst of Vitality before the Shockwave comes and hits you, you're going to be in a much better spot because if you get hit, you don't need to worry about running out of life points or dying. But yeah, with that said, let's show you the timing. For starters, I like to stand in the exact area that I'm standing right now, one singular tile behind the gold square. But I'll also highlight on screen that you can actually do this anywhere in the arena, so if you wanted to be east or west of this, as long as you're this distance from the center, you're going to be able to do this method and step one tile forward, it should work. We'll highlight all of the safe tiles. But with that said, for this one, it's pretty simple. All we're going to do is we're going to wait for the animation to play, and you're going to see the telegraphing. There is one singular game tick of window between each zone of the arena exploding. So all you need to do is you need to wait for the very moment that that first area right in front of your character explodes, and then before the area you're currently standing in explodes, which is one singular tick later, you just need to step forward. And let's show this twice back to back because this mechanic does happen twice. And right there, the first area explodes. I step forward and I step back. 
And then for the second one, it is the exact same process. There are a couple really good visual indicators for when you want to click that one tile forward to dodge this mechanic, but the one that I personally like by far the most is as follows. What we're going to do is you're going to see the telegraphing show up and you're going to see that very first square, which I've marked. And that first square is showing the first area of the very first explosion. So that's the area that is going to be taking damage. So obviously that's the area that we need to step into as soon as that explosion has passed. But then we've also got a visual indicator that is a wave going from the inside all the way to the outside. And what I like to do is I actually like to look at that. And then as soon as that wave indicator that's moving from the catcher's feet towards my character gets halfway through the gold square, that is when I click. So let's play it and I'll show you what it looks like. As soon as the indicator is halfway through the gold square, I'm going to click. And just like that, we're safe. It's going to happen a second time. And then right as soon as it's halfway through the gold square, I'm going to click again. And just like that, we've successfully done the step method twice in a row. You may need to play around with the timing just a little bit, but it is consistent. One other trick I really like for dodging the shockwave is that the timing between having to step in the first time and the second time is two global cooldowns, which each global cooldown is 1.8 seconds. Another way of looking at that is it's actually just two abilities. So effectively, what we're gonna do here is if you use an ability and then step in, use an ability and then step out, and then use an ability and then step in, you will actually successfully dodge the mechanic. So there we go, I've stepped in, I've used an ability, I've stepped out, I've used an ability, and I've stepped in. And the timing is very, very consistent from that standpoint. So you can kind of get into a rhythm where the movement is actually a lot easier than you would think based on how tight the timing window is. Now let's take off the slow-mo and watch it back in normal speed. As you can see, the shockwave is coming towards me. I'm waiting for the right moment, clicking forward, I'm stepping back, then I'm stepping forward one more time to successfully dodge the mechanic. But still, if that seems a little bit hard for you, that is entirely okay. It's also really important to remember at this moment that if you do get hit by this, it is not the end of the world and you will have enough life points, especially if you power burst to vitality. But now, let's go look at a different and an easier method of dealing with the shockwave. This time around for the shockwave, I'm starting in the exact same position, but instead of having to do tick perfect timing and stepping forward, this time around, I'm actually gonna be running away from the shockwave and then using the escape ability to escape my character back into the area that has already exploded. In doing so, it's a lot safer, especially if you run far enough, because as you can see there, I've actually visually seen that the area around the catcher's feet has completely exploded. So I know for a fact that I am safe to escape back into it and I will not take any damage. And now for the second shockwave, I'm just going to repeat the exact same thing where I'm going to run out and then I'm going to escape back in. This should give you a little bit more leeway. And it's also worth noting that if you want to use dive, you're welcome to do that as well. And those are sort of the two recommended ways of dealing with the shockwave. But if you're absolutely desperate to get through this mechanic, you can also just use a power burst of vitality and put the food in and you will be completely fine. As long as you're eating up, this mechanic will not kill you. So my recommendation would be to plan for the worst, make sure your life points are nice and high in case you get hit by this thing, and then use it as an opportunity to practice and learn the timing so that eventually after a few kills or a bit of practice, you've got it down every single time. But then, as soon as the shockwave ends, the catcher is not done, and we're gonna get into an absolute ton of mechanics that are layered on top of each other. Coming out of the shockwave, the catcher is gonna say, prepare for death, and you're gonna get another magic onslaught. Something worth noting is that if you are face tanking the shockwave, you are gonna have your defensive abilities reset, but they will come off cooldown on time to successfully dodge this account. If you're planning on tanking the shockwave with your face, just make sure that you've got devotion available, pray magic, and then you may need to spam click it so that it comes off at the exact moment that you need it. But because I'm a little short on damage due to my setup being absolutely terrible, for me, what I'm gonna choose to do here is I'm actually gonna do the same thing I did for the very first magic onslaught, which is I'm gonna do reflect, reprisal, Vitpot and a resonant strategy to get an absolute ton of damage done back to Nakatra. And this time around, it's actually doing close to 60,000 damage. After that mechanic, we're now gonna have three sets of ground tiles in a row because it is the final phase. So this time, whenever you see those ground tiles where she's lighting up areas on the floor, you're gonna get three back to back to back. And then after that, we've got some more telegraphing that we're very well used to. But this one's a little bit different because as soon as this ground mechanic is halfway, you're actually going to go into a second set of three ground tiles. And this happens extremely quickly and in a way that is quite dangerous. 
Something that's really good to do here is just pray deflect magic just in case, because there is a lot going on, and you want to prioritize dodging the ground mechanics on the floor. If you end up taking some magic damage, it is not the end of the world, but keep your life points high and keep your magic prayer on. And then, congratulations, if you've made it this far, we're actually completely out of the first cycle, so now we're going to repeat it for the second one. Every time you go into the Devourer's Plane, you're actually going to receive different icons. So as I'm dealing with killing off these Soul Devourers, I'm also going to notice that my two icons are this time a Crocodile, and then the one that I like to call the Dude Chillin'. One other thing I'm doing here is before clicking on the third fragment and releasing it, because I've noticed that I've actually got time before my soul is devoured, I'm actually going to attack one of the gorillas just to give myself some bonus adrenaline. No matter what combat style you're using, adrenaline is beneficial, so I'm doing a little bit of building, and then at the very last second, I'm clicking to get back into the boss fight. And this time around, because there was a crocodile, a dude chillin', and not a monkey, I'm going to stand on the monkey icon to safely dodge. And this cycle is going to be a repeat of the first one. I'm actually doing it in exactly the same way as well, where I will be electing to instead of doing the step forward method that I sometimes mess up, especially when I'm panicking or if there's any kind of pressure or stress on me, like there would be in this skill. So I'm going to elect to use double escape. Then we're just going through it in the exact same way as before. This time you're going to see some more ground mechanics, but you're also going to notice that we're standing in a nice spot to actually not have to do all that much moving. There was also an RNG component to it as well, because sometimes you'll just end up standing at a spot that Nakatra doesn't pick at all. But now we've got some more ground mechanics, and I believe I made my first mistake here, where I actually end up getting hit and I take 6,923 damage. It's worth noting that I did just switch to a Hellhound in this kill, so without a Hellhound, we're looking at closer to 8,500 damage, which is a whole lot. But the most important thing you can do for yourself on this phase is keep your life points high. Food is for being eaten, and eating food is absolutely awesome, because if you get hit by one of these mechanics, the worst thing you can do is panic and then let yourself die. You know these things come in groups of three, so you know there's going to be another ground mechanic coming up. So I'm going to focus up, I'm going to dive out of the way, and we're safely dodging all of those ground mechanics without dying. Something else that happens at Nakatra is that every time she attacks you throughout the fight on phase four, she's actually going to gain enrage stacks that you can actually see on screen. She gains them through the earlier phases of the fight, but they cap out at a certain point. On this fourth phase, I don't think they cap at all, and if they do, it's at a very, very high number. But because I've got so many stacks, this time around, when I'm actually heading into the Devourer's Plane, you're going to notice something a little bit different, which is that instead of playing regular Pictionary, we are now stuck in hard mode, where instead of seeing two icons, We've actually got four. I've got the face, I've got the pyramid, I've got the sun, and I've got the monkey. This works exactly the same way as you would expect it to, in the same way that it worked previously, but this time around, when we come out of the Devourer's Plane, Nakatra, instead of showing three symbols and just having to pick one out of three, Nakatra is actually going to show us five. So you need to be very, very careful for this. And just like that, we're back outside. It feels very weird seeing Nakatra with five symbols on the floor, but we're going to stand on the squiggly line, or what I would call the squiggly line. And just like that, we're going to death mark Nakatra, and we are going to cruise our way to our 100th hard mode Nakatra solo and the Devour Aura. But not just that, we're also going to get ourselves a drop. And just like that, with no armor, with tier 50 weapons, and with no food, we've managed to claim ourselves a beautiful tier 95 wand. So with that said, thank you all so much for watching. I really hope this video helped. Feedback is very appreciated as well in the comments below. Uh, let me know what you think of this format where instead of us using kind of the same easy necromancy strategy in Revo Bar, we're instead focusing on the mechanics. And the hope is that you feel like no matter what gear, what combat style you're bringing to Nakatra, if you deal with the mechanics correctly and you follow this guide, you will be able to get a kill. With that said, I'm looking forward to reading all your comments. If you enjoyed the video, uh, I would really appreciate a sub as we push towards 100,000 that is really, really far away, but I still think we can do it. And outside of that, I will see you very soon for the next one. Take care, everyone.